when she was tested positive they asked where all she went she was at the walmart she went to the restaurant and all oh. that uh-huh. so but the restaurant was closed at that point so she was only taking food out so even then people who were waiting outside for the take out right they were who were was there around a given particular time right were informed so they they, they made a new saying that okay if you were in walmart during this time of this particular day yeah. you better go test it test it yourself test it yourself Mm-hmm. like as if you were at this restaurant take out between this these times and on this particular day better get tested so that way they were tracing and uh, they were avoiding all the unnecessary uh, say uh, spreading that was good so we have uh, no new cases only one active case and uh, total seven deaths uh, in the okay. province but that that happened in actually in april very april beginning after that it was well contained in you i mean canada like uh, ontario and uh, quebec so they were seriously affected quebec there so many people died very oh. all very senior people like uh, all uh, senior home About care 70 huh. yeah I mean bunch of people in same home care uh, died like right. uh, multiple home cares only those people were affected quite a bit and then yeah yeah is is the is the thing online now or uh, only we two talking right <laughs> no 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 many are online you know okay. many okay you are not you are not started the whole thing yet yeah no no so uh, students are registering i mean participating oh, okay okay but here the, here in india the major problem is population of course density density of population yeah. and uh, uh, yeah, you must be uh, knowing about that uh, Thalabi, Thalabi uh, Chal, I mean the uh, slum area of mm. Maharashtra, Mumbai. Yeah. So just, uh, I mean Dharabi, uh, uh, they were uh, guessing that uh, community transmission may be started there, I mean have started. But, uh, now they are saying no they i mean the content i mean they mm. yes yes sir. yeah yeah lot of how many, how many people are, how many people are registered for this uh, meeting uh many actually 2000 more than 1000 people have registered uh, go only we have given uh, 200 something uh, but more these uh, participants are preferring to watch uh, live in oh. face the youtube okay okay so are you also mm-hmm. recording recording this uh, yes we are recording the whole thing okay, uh, okay. <laughs> oh boy 2000 that's big ah both of 2000 yeah after that stopped we did not accept of course yeah first uh, yeah. yeah. too bad yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think we'll start. So let me introduce first. Okay. Uh, Should then, I start sharing the uh, slide? Sure, you can. Okay. 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 Good morning, everyone. So today we are going to start our uh, second day, first session program. Um, today, actually, we have two sessions. Earlier, it was we had planned for three sessions, but our session is set to twenty eighth uh, July, and today only we have two sessions. First session, uh, the topic of the first session is financial application of machine learning, and the speaker. of the first session is professor rupa k tulsiram he is a professor of university of manitoba canada uh, in the department of computer science 
Uh, he received his PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India. And Dr. Tulsi's correct research interests include computational finance, cloud computing, blockchain technology for financial applications and related areas. He is the founder of Computational Finance Derivatives Lab at University of Manitoba and Disciplinary Center of Excellence in Computational Finance. He is associated with many professional societies such as IEEE, SEM, ASSC, CMS, etc. So uh, I think uh, now we will, I should request Professor uh, Tulsiram to start his lecture. So now over to Professor Tulsiram. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Bash, and uh, good morning, all. Uh, uh, so it's Friday morning there in India, of course. Yes, here is uh, where I am in uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. It is uh, ten thirty on uh, Friday, uh, Thursday evening, right? Thursday night, ten thirty. So again, uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to this talk. Uh, the topic of this talk is uh, AI and machine learning (ML) in finance and uh, the two important problems that I'm going to talk about and introduce you and then talk about are the option pricing problem as well as the forecasting problem, forecasting of stock prices. So the first one, uh, the option pricing, we're going to use one kind of the AI technique that is inspired uh, from nature and then the price forecasting, we're going to use the uh, machine learning, deep learning idea. Of, uh, both, of course, are in finance. So I'll uh, try to introduce you to problem in uh, uh, option pricing, which is one of the important problem in what is called the derivative uh, markets. So uh, how that problem requires forecasting the stock prices is what the second part of the talk is. So again, uh, my name is Rupa K. Tulsiram, and I'm from University of Manitoba in the Department of Computer Science. This is uh, in the city of Winnipeg in Canada, in the province of Manitoba. You'll see from the uh, map in a minute, uh, the Manitoba where it is in Canada. So before that, let me first uh, thank all my uh, team members who are current and past who have contributed this uh, uh, ideas and the contributions in, in terms of the idea generation, concept generations. So those who are involved directly in these two projects are uh, Dr. Pramila Plesraman, my wife, who's also a professor in the department, Gobin Preet Singh, who finished master's and he's working in a company in Toronto now, uh, Mr. Rajal Kareem and Nasib Hussain. And these are a few other uh, students who have directly and indirectly contributed to this uh, uh, concepts that we're going to be introducing in this, in this talk. Right? And most of the uh, students were supported by this um, uh, major two major grants in Metro Sciences and Engineering Research Council called NSERC Canada. We have a program called Discovery Grant Program. So I've been uh, fortunate enough to get this funding for the last uh, 20 years uh, continuously. And then we had like Engage Grant, which is uh, partnering with industry. And then we have uh, in the uh, province of Manitoba, we have what is called the URGP, which is organized by the University of Manitoba, University Research Grant Program. And then within faculty, there is a, a science interdisciplinary research program, which is between say science and engin uh, engineering, science and uh, business school, science and uh, agriculture faculty. So it's an interdisciplinary research program. We have a couple of uh, research funding on that. There are a few other smaller ones as well. Okay, so here is a wide uh, map of Canada, Montreal, Toronto, and then we are here, Winnipeg, the whole big province of Manitoba, which is just north of North Dakota in U.S., just one hour from the U.S. border. And if you want to uh, ever see a polar bear, and we have the what is called the polar bear capital of uh, the world, somewhere here, which is in the city called Churchill, right? So that's the province within the province of Manitoba. So Winnipeg is uh, bounded so by a couple of, uh, say, uh, uh, rivers. Hello? Professor, we are yeah. not able to see your presentation. Oh. Please I, share it. I, I'm sharing it. Okay. I'm sharing. Uh, it's, um, I don't know. Let's see. Yeah, please try again. Okay. 
Let me try again. How about now? Uh, not yet. Okay, now, oh. now I guess it's coming. Yeah, okay. yeah. Now, now we got it. <laughs> okay, I thought it was showing all this time. Oh, sorry. So, so please feel free to stop me if uh, something wrong uh, on these slides or the presentation. Right? Fine, no issues. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. I, I, I guess you need to explain the map again. Yeah. So, <laughs> so this is the whole Canada map. Of course, so you didn't see maybe all these uh, the previous slides, right? Excuse me, we are not uh, getting the presentation and we are not uh, You are getting? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, pin, 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 pin to his presentation Okay You need to pin to Professor Tulsi Ram's presentation, okay? Yeah, we are able to see Please so go ahead you, you have to do that, pinning you have to do, I guess, yeah Okay Yeah Please go okay. ahead, sir Yeah Okay, so so if you want to contact me, uh, my email is tulsi at cs.humanitober.ca. I can get some more information about my publications and other projects at uh, cshumanitober.ca. This is tilda tulsi. That's my homepage. And this is my team, as I just mentioned. These are the people who are directly involved in this project and other students and PhDs and postdocs who uh, are contributed to the whole program uh, in the last uh, several years, like 20 years. And then these are the agencies where from my research has been supported. Like for example, the major one is the NSERC uh, Canada, uh, where we have what is called a Discovery Grant Program, which has been supporting me for the last uh, 20 years. And then we have uh, industry partners uh, through this so-called the Engage Grant, NSERC Engage Grant. Provincially, we have research funding coming through the university called URGP. And then within the university, we have some interdisciplinary research program between Faculty of Science and Business School, Faculty of Science, Engineering, Faculty of Science, and uh, Agriculture. So we have all this uh, funding secure for uh, doing all this research. And so the province of Manitoba is almost the very middle of the uh, the country of Canada. Right? So some here. And Winnipeg is almost the southern part of the province, and which is about one hour uh, drive from the U.S. border, we, we, we bordered with North Dakota and Minnesota, and we have what is called the polar bear capital of the world, where we find polar bears here roaming around freely uh, in the city of uh, the town of Churchill, which is very part, uh, not part of uh, Manitoba. And Winnipeg, which is the southern part of uh, uh, the uh, province, there we have the university, which is at the southern part of that city itself. So, which is kind of uh, hugged by this uh, river called Red River, and there is another river called Assiniboine River, and this is where the university is uh, lo located. And so, this is really hugged by this Rio Red River. Is this sprawling campus of uh, the University of <coughs> Manitoba here? Right. So, we are somewhere here. The, um, uh, the engineering building where the computer science department is. Okay, so let me first uh, get into the first part of the uh, talk, which is the option contract or the financial option contract where we try to price uh, what is uh, 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 option value is, right? Yeah. So the option contract is basically a type of contract between two investing parties. So two people are involved. So the first party who kind of buys buyer are uh, also called the holder gets the right to buy or sell an, an underlying asset at a fixed price for a specific period of time that means instead of investing directly in a stock you want to watch the market how it behaves and during this period of watching you still have a consign for buying a particular stock at a later date so that's what this option contract is Okay. So the other party that I'm going to buy, the other party who is going to sell me what I wanted is known as the writer, and that person is obliged, supposed to be obliged for my decision, whatever I decide at end of that uh, at the end of that specific period of time. So if it is three months, at the end of three months, whatever I decide, the other party has to be obliging. That means if I want to buy, he has to sell it to me at the price. That was fixed in the contract so we'll see more detail we'll give more uh, say names for these uh, uh, terms soon 
So for, for in order to get that kind of uh, security, I have to pay a premium, right? The buyer or the holder pays a premium to the writer at the time of getting into the contract, right? So that's the kind of investment that I make in order to give me a security of watching the price behavior so that we, I can decide after one month, two months, three months, whatever period that I fix in the contract, right? So there are two types of, types of options available, of course, only call option, which gives the holder a right, a right to buy, and the put option gives the holder the right to sell, right? So we are going to mostly focus on the call option for this talk. Once you understand what call option is, the put option is just the other way around, right? It is for selling. All right. So there are a few uh, parameters that we need to be uh, focusing on. There are five of them, uh, importantly. The underlying asset price, that means if you're trying to buy a, a, a stock, that is the asset price, that as a, the stock is the asset here, what is the price of the current price of that particular stock, right? The current value of the underlying asset. And strike price is the predetermined price, or the fixed price, as I mentioned in the previous slide. That's the price that at which I'm going to buy the asset at the end of that contract period, okay? And the contract period is the time between the start and expiration of that contract. I can make, make it like to two months, three months, six months, nine months, whatever, right? There are, there are options which are long-term option, like 30-year option, 30 years, right? So there are such things also bonds. And the, another major uh, say parameter one has to be worried about is the volatility, uh, which is the degree of price movement. How volatile uh, how frequently the price is changing right, in, the, in the market so how volatile is the market is so that's the most important parameter and this, this itself is a big research area finding the, or the computing the volatility so we have done uh, work uh, on uh, volatility estimation uh, as a completely statistical problem in a, in a separate study so i'm not going to get into that for now what we assume in this particular topic is that volatility is constant Right? You can always plug in other models uh, for finding the volatility and then plug into this problem uh, for the implementation purposes. And interest rate is the bank rate that we normally see for, say, in general, it's not exactly the bank rate for the common person sees, but it is the government, like, for example, in Canada, we have Bank of Canada rate. That's the interest rate which the government of Canada fixes for lending purposes between the institutions, financial institutions like banks. Likewise, we, in India, we have RBI to do that, right? So these are the five important parameters that we need to be worrying about for this problem. So here's a quick example to understand how the uh, stock market and the option market uh, differs or how, how they work, right? Let's say we have a stock which is trading, let's say $50 currently, right? So in one month period, let's say, the price might go down to $20 or it might increase to $80, okay? So if you have a stock, right, if when the price goes down, if you invested originally $50, when, it price, when the price goes down to 20, your loss is $30, right, 60% loss. Right? If the price goes up with the stock, your initial investment is still $50, the price went up to 80, so your profit is 30, of course, 60% say profit, right? But of course, what we are not taking into account is all the commissions and fees and other, say, um, charges that you might incur for executing this contract. That means holding, buying, selling, all those things. So let's now look at the other uh, product, that is the option for which we had to set the price when you enter the contract, that is the strike price, which is $60. So today is $50, strike price is $60, right? You will expect the price to go beyond, say, $60. Okay, so now initial investment, that means for entering the contract, you pay a premium, that premium is set, let's say, at $5. That means about one-tenth of uh, $50, right? That's 10%, right? And the strike is $60 here. So when the price is, uh, the stock price is low, right? You don't want to buy through that, that particular stock through your option contract because through your option contract, you have to pay $60. Whereas 
in the open market it is available at $20 so you will not buy that stock through your contract i mean it will be a loss unnecessarily right so why do you go for that loss so instead you will just let the uh, contract die that means you lose that $5 the premium that you paid at the beginning so that loss now is 100% so you you paid $100 $5 you lost the entire five dollars because you're going to buy at only twenty dollars. Right? You are not worrying about your contract at that point. On the other side, when the price is high, right? When the price from, went up to eighty dollars from fifty, you init your initial investment is still five dollars, and you are going to buy through the contract at sixty dollars. Right, so not you're going to you're not going to buy at eighty dollars. Open market, it is eighty dollars, but you have secured the contract to buy this underlying asset, the stock, at sixty dollars. So what you do is you not hold it. You immediately sell it at eighty dollars. The open market, right? So you sell it eighty dollars. You bought at sixty dollars. You have paid five dollar premium at the beginning, so the profit will be fifteen dollars. So your initial investment was five dollars. Your return of profit is fifteen dollars. That means your overall profit is the three hundred percent, three times, right? So that's how the option market becomes beneficial, and it happens within a minute. So you're going to buy immediately, sell, right? You're not going to hold uh, this option, I mean the underlying stock at all. Be when you have the option which is uh, going to bring you profit, you're not going to hold it. You will immediately sell it. So this turnaround is just within a minute, right? So you can be doing multiple such contracts. That means you might generate I mean, hundreds and hundreds of dollars or rather like, because the investment is not in small quantities. So one option is normally going to have 100 stocks. One option contract means 100 stocks. So we're talking about just one stock here. So 100 stocks means within a minute, you're going to get $1,500. So if you have multiple contracts going on that are expiring, say, every day, if the market is bullish, that means the price is always going up, you might expect to see your profit every time going up and up and up. Right? So that's the beauty of this option contract. It gives also the security if the, price, if the stock price falls, you're going to lose only your premium. You're not going to, say, incur much losses. Right? But it is not totally risk free because you don't know how the price is going to behave. So that's when the price prediction comes into effect. That's the second part of my talk. Like if you predict accurately, you can buy such uh, say contracts judiciously and make the decision to say uh, exercise. That means buy or sell at appropriate time and then make profit continuously. That's what the Invest, investors do most of the people in New York Stock Ex, I mean, uh, New York City and the New York Stock Exchange, or basically the money managers do. Okay. Okay. So, what is the problem? Like, what is meant by option pricing problem? Predicting the present value of an option from any future time of the contract. That's the first thing. Like, okay, if it's going to be the price is going from today, this price to next one price, they be decreasing, increasing, increasing. So if you know what is the future price at one particular time, what is the worth of this future price today, right? That's the important factor we have to consider in order to compare how it is say, trading now so that we can decide if this is going to bring me any profit or not. So that means we have to speculate the asset price behavior, right, which may be varying violently or uh, the volatility is very, very high. And the worth of this, say, option contract is going to be called computed using the what is called a payoff. The payoff is nothing but the select the $80 minus $60. This 80 is the asset price, the stock price, and 60 was the start price. So maximum S minus K or zero, right? If it was 20, right? I'm not going to buy it from there, right? So if the strike was, then the stock was 20 and the strike was 60, it is minus 40. The maximum of this is zero. That means I'm not going to exercise. So I'm letting the option die. So that this is the so-called the payoff for the call option. And for the put option, it is just the other way around, K minus yes, right? So that we are not going to see for now for this stock, the put option, right? Call option, maximum of S minus K and zero. I hope it is clear so far what we are trying to do uh, for this particular um, <clears throat> problem, option pricing. That means predicting the present value and then trying to 
uh, say, see how much it is worth today. Okay? So there are various uh, styles. So there are two types we saw, call option, put option. And but that option, that's two of them. Let's say only one of them for now, call option, that means buying the asset can be exercised in many different styles. So there are European, American, there are other complex options. So European means it exercise only at the expiration time. If the contract is three months, you're going to be given the option of exercising it only at the end of the third month, three months or end of the third month, 90th day. So whatever the price is at that point, the difference is the one that you're going to be profiting from. Right? American option will give you the right to exercise any time before the expiration. So what you might expect in this case is that because it is giving you more flexibility, the premium is going to be naturally higher, right? So that's what the the American option is going to be. So we have results for American option, but I'm going to talk more in terms of European in this case because it is easier to follow because American option pricing problem is an open boundary problem, which, is, which involves uh, several other uh, complications, right? And likewise, there are many other styles, Asian option, Russian. But anyway, these names like European, American, Asian, Russian, uh, these things have nothing to do with the geography, right? This is not that it is only available in Europe or this is only available in America. No, everywhere, every, everything is available, right? So Asian option is something like you have a particular, say, um, uh, deadline or a fixed a date for exercising. Russian is like the exercise time itself is going to be moving. So boundary, the uh, uh, the boundary wall is going to be moving. There are barrier options. You set a particular price. If it hits that price and goes beyond, you will start uh, exercising. Or uh, if it goes down below a particular price, you will start selling. So there are multiple such uh, say styles. There are even more such uh, complex uh, options. Right. So what we have considered here is European and American only. So these are a few of the um, uh, classical techniques uh, for uh, pricing options. One is the black scholes Merton model. Those who know some fluid mechanics engineering, of course, they would understand that this is nothing but maybe a stock equations uh, in finance, right? And this model uh, won Nobel Prize in 1998. And, and of course, originally this was, uh, uh, say, published in 1973. And this uh, uh, it still works, but uh, the the company these uh, these people like these two Myron Scholes and Robert Merton were uh, partners with the long term capital management. That's a company called LTCM. It collapsed for many different reasons, but the model itself is still uh, valid uh, quite a good extent. So this is a base model. People build on. Uh, for further, say, complicated or the sophisticated models. So this model assumes volatility is constant, which is a very big assumption, and we can price only European option because this one gives you the solution in closed form. The the model, the equations, is just basically a stochastic partial differential equation. Okay, they solved uh, base, base, uh, using certain assumptions, including the volatility, constant volatility, and, and they could price only European option. For American option, this is not good enough. Right? Of course, people relax assumptions and have made uh, different models, and then they can also price a uh, slightly more complicated model than European option. This is uh, the so-called the continuous time approach. And people saw that why not we discretize the time? Like so, because the prices is not going to change continuously. So why not we split it in into uh, a, a smaller time steps? Right. That means the one time step price may go up or go down. From the next of a uh, second time step, it may go up or go down, and likewise. Right. You can see a binomial or the binary tree structure coming up. Like you, computer science, we know how to handle tree structure. Right. Binary tree. Uh, that is called the binomial lattice model, which is uh, computationally intensive because if, if you, uh, for a six months contract, let's or a three month contract, let's say you are going to see the prices only at the end of each month, right? You are kind of skipping the entire month's behavior, price behavior, one month price behavior. That is too much to lose. So, what you would like to do, okay. I can split into four steps, this one step into four steps, right? First one month into four weeks, right? 
So still I'm missing the entire, say, uh, price changes for the entire week. That means I'm collecting prices only end of one week. That is too too much to lose. Okay, so that means instead of four step here in one step, I can try to split that one week into, say, five days. So that means I will have one step split into now 20 steps, right? Four times five, 20 steps for ca capturing price data. So that means you are capturing only the closing price of every day. That is 20 uh, steps here, just in one step. So you can imagine how many steps now you will see uh, this whole um, tree will be going into. That means it is exponentially growing, right? But even the single day pricing is not good enough. So you have to go for hourly pricing, capturing the prices. Even that is not good enough because we have now a powerful computer. So people even go for milliseconds, microseconds, and nanoseconds because the so-called algorithmic trading or arbitrage trading, high performance trading, all those things come to the uh, level of nanoseconds. That means if you see a change, small change in prices from one particular say um, uh, exchange or one particular uh, time to the next time uh, if there is a deviation you can also you can try to make use of that small change that's hap that may stay for a, for a millisecond but if you capture it in a nanosecond if you execute it in microsecond and come out before a millisecond you made money right so that's the so-called the the arbitrage trading and of course there are similar concepts uh, with the algorithmic trading and high performance trading algorithmic trading doesn't have to be in this uh, uh, finite detail but they always look for a particular price range so there's basically automated trading algorithmic trading means so based on this uh, tree because there's so much variation happening the computational requirement becomes very high right because it is computationally intensive so instead of having such uh, structured um, uh, say development of the prices we can also generate some random walk right for the price movement so that one random walk second third fourth like you can keep generating random walks through this so-called the Monte Carlo simulation and of course again uh, you're not going to be fully capturing all the different price paths uh, by several number of uh, random walks. So you have to generate like millions and millions of such random walks. Even that becomes computationally intensive. Of course, the accuracy becomes less uh, pronounced here with Monte Carlo than the binomial. Of course, this is the most uh, uh, accurate solution, but it is only for European option. Okay, the, what are these? Um, uh, those are classical. Classical means like uh, the Black Shell model came 1973, the binomial lattice came 1979, so also the uh, Monte Carlo 1979. So, in the unconventional, when the uh, idea of, say, uh, artificial intelligence came into picture, people started using neural networks to uh, try to do the option pricing. We have done some work on this. And then there are uh, bio inspired techniques such as the um, genetic programming, genetic algorithm, and then the naturally inspired techniques such as the particle swarm optimization and colony optimization. And the one that we're going to talk about is a much later, uh, say most latest uh, uh, naturally inspired algorithm called the Firefly algorithm. We'll, we'll describe what it is now quickly. So the option pricing uh, it is basically a multi-objective optimization problem where we try to compute the accurate option prices, how accurate we can get to options so that we can make right decision so that our profit is really um, high. Right? So that means we try to formulate this problem as a multi-objective optimization problem and then design and develop some efficient algorithm to find the solution for this optimization problem. And then we try to evaluate the option value using real market data. We have some Bloomberg uh, data that we have used in this case. So what you have basically come up with in this particular study is the design and development of a Firefly algorithm to find a solution for adaptive weighted sum based Firefly algorithm on non nominated charting. I'll explain these two in the next few slides. Uh, modeling the option pricing is a multi-objective optimization. That means payoff and the probability of achieving the payoff and the objectives here, two objectives in this case. But there are multiple sub-objectives for each of these objectives, right? But we uh, kind of combine them into two, but later on in the adaptive weighted sum based uh, firefly algorithm, we are going to combine these two 
themselves into a single objective problem but here non-dominated sorting will try to keep uh, both separate but here is kind of a conflicting kind of uh, arrangement here payoff and the probability of achieving the payoff if you if the problem if the payoff is high already that means the stock price is really going up the probability that the price will go even higher becomes less and less so the probability is now probability of achieving higher payoff becomes smaller and smaller right so it's kind of opposite behavior there so we have evaluated the results of option pricing using global PL market data. We'll see what the data is later on. And then we compared with the classical option pricing techniques. And then one other important thing that we have done here is to not just provide one solution, but we have given a kind of a Pareto optimal solution so that based on the risk level of the individual investor, Every solution will be a solution for each uh, different group of investors. So if someone is really uh, uh, willing to take a lot of risk, there is a solution for that, which will try to bring a higher, say, uh, option value. Whereas for um, low risk taker, there is another solution available. So the perfect optimal solution will be fitting for many, uh, uh, a big set of, uh, say, investors. So it all depends on the individual who uh, is willing to take uh, what what all level of risk uh, for their investment. Right? So this is one of the latest nature inspired techniques uh, proposed by Zinzi in 2008. Uh, it's proved to be more efficient in other areas of say application, real world applications than any other meta heuristic algorithms. Uh, the one that I mentioned, the ACO and call me or the particle swarm or the B problems, etc. Of course, we have not seen anyone using Firefly for option pricing. That's the idea of uh, using that's a motivation for us to do this particular problem. And of course, this is uh, Firefly is basically inspired by a unique flashing light behavior of the fireflies. So fireflies in the night, they are glowing in the dark, right? So the, the purpose of the such flashing is two things. One is either attract mating partner, that means the communication between those two uh, say individual say uh, uh, insects or in this case individual investor i uh, i have a say stock that i want to sell if anybody wants to buy right this is my contract you can decide if you want to uh, buy this contract right so that's it that we need so the more attractive i am i can bring along more say investors to my contract so the same contract i can buy I, I mean same asset i can sell it to multiple people right at different contracts at different strike prices and i mean security exchange commission allows you to do that as long as you guarantee them that oh you will be able to deliver the stocks when the other party decides to buy it from you and so that for that you have to show okay i have this much deposit and I can buy from the open market whatever the price of the stock at that point is so that I can deliver that to all these people who are always willing to buy at that point if they decide to buy, right? So the, that is the idea of, uh, say, between uh, the uh, Firefly and the uh, uh, the, the uh, option market, right? And also they use the flashing in order to warn potential, say, uh, prey, right? So that means, the, the based on the premium, you can try to avoid some people who are say low risk takers. So that way, you are kind of warning them. Okay, if the prime premium is high, if you set the premium high, the risk is definitely going to be higher. So that's the warning that you're providing to some investors. So you can avoid some of them, right. So you can attract, and also you can uh, warn some some investors. So each firefly has a tendency to move towards a brighter firefly. They are that naturally they are attracted to the better, uh, uh, say, uh, more uh, brighter firefly. That's in nature. So that's exactly what. Like if I have a flag, say, high enough, which will be visible to many investors, of course, I'm going to see. I'm going to be seen by multiple investors. So a few of the assumptions here: light intensity of each fire, uh, firefly is proportional to the quality of solution. That's for sure here, directly uh, understandable. So that means the attractiveness is directly proportional to the brightness. That means the attractiveness, how attractive my my contract is, is how high I am or how uh, say 
brightly I am say advertising or how brightly I am say attracting them right also the attractiveness is indirectly proportional to the distance in the natural world if the fly the fireflies are far apart they are not going to see each other and likewise here bringing together the investors is what going to be attract, increasing the attractiveness if they are too far apart they are not going to be seeing each other right so the the uh, concept of the uh, trading pit came up with this kind of idea of course that time nobody thought about the uh, firefly algorithm so the the movement here of the fireflies consists of two elements approaching to a better solution that is the coming from the uh, uh, the attractiveness to the uh, pro being proportional to the brightness and also they move randomly right so that's the two elements how the movement happens but then if you randomly move if you go out of a solution space that's no use for that means for implementation purposes that means for the simulation purposes we have to set a, some, some sort of a, a solution uh, boundary so that the particles that we simulate are not going to be uh, going out of this point. Yeah. So here is the model, option pricing, this model that's a multi-objective, the two objectives are the payoff and the probability of achieving the payoff. And we have, how do we achieve payoff? We have the stock price, that means the asset value, right? And we have exercise time, right? And then we know how to find the payoff, like this, in the, for the European option, it is simply S minus K, that's the first objective. And based on the exercise time and the asset value, because if you if you're uh, if it is a three month contract, and then at the beginning you have more opportunity for the price to go up. That means the probability of the price going up to bring you more profit is higher, right? The probability is much higher. As you approach your exercise time, that means as you approach your uh, say end of your contract period, the probability of the price say changing too much is kind of limiting that means your time value is decreasing so that means your probability of getting higher payoff is decreasing right in this case so those are the two objectives how are you going to they're contradicting to each other like if you have higher payoff the probability of achieving the higher payoff is smaller so how are you going to achieve that so how are you going to give weights for each one of these two is the important problem here so finding a solution that maximizes both objectives is what uh, important for uh, for us in this case. That means we had to find a, a fitness value that is function of both payoff and the probability in this case. Right? So if the probability is high, then the rate of change of payoff is low and vice versa. That means these objective behave in opposite manner. So how how are we going to capture that, right? So, so instead of looking at this figure, I will show another figure how to uh, see, uh, understand the behavior of these two, right? So, main aim is to find our what is called a Pareto optimal solution. So, then Pareto optimal solution is basically a set of optimal solutions which trade off objectives at different possible levels. So, the probability of uh, achieving is lower, that means your payoff is already higher. So, your payoff is high, already higher, that means if you are if your risk taking is only at fifty percent, that's all you're going to get. So you, you you cannot expect to go for higher payoff than that. That that's how it will be seen. Like in the in the final solution, you will see. Okay. So we have two techniques to uh, implement this problem. One is adaptive weighted sum based firefly. That means we give weights for the payoff and the probability w one w two, and then convert this multi objective to a single objective problem, and then we'll compute the uh, uh, which is also going to be a computationally intensive uh, approach in this case because we have to uh, give multiple different variations for this weight for each of these objectives that way we can try to get the best fitness uh, higher fitness value for this problem so I'll not get too much into the detail but I'll spend more time on to the second technique which is the non-dominated sorting firefly algorithm so it is one of the newly defined efficient multiple object algorithms is based on the concept of non-dominated sorting. So how we see how the solutions are behaving, uh, say, compared to each other. Based on that, we do a sorting, which will give us a very nice operator of friend of solutions. So the main goal is to efficiently find a complete set of non-dominated solution, which represents true operator uh, friend. We'll see what we mean by non-dominated sorting soon. So this is the entire algorithm. So we start, and then we initialize all the parameters. We do the non-dominated sorting, 
add these non-dominated non solutions to the archive and we'll find the fitness value and then we'll based on the fitness value we adjust our population using the firefly and do the sorting again and repeat it until we find the final say exit value or if you reach the uh, termination condition satisfied so initialization involves like uh, input and uh, both option firefly parameters upper and lower bound to define a search space so because you don't want particles to randomly move out of the solution space we set a boundary and then we initialize the population randomly and evaluate the objective values for the initial population that is the first set of solution and then we do the non-dominated sorting which involves like finding comparing the solution in order to sort them so that best solution can be picked up right so we have two functions in this case like payoff and the uh, 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 say uh, uh, probability of achieving the payoff let's say we have two general uh, functions optimization function or f1 you want to minimize ft you want to maximize we have multiple solution, say x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, right, five of them. If a solution x1 is not worse than another solution x2 in all objectives, that means it is non-dominated. A solution x1 is strictly better than x2 in at least one objective, then it is non-dominated by this uh, other solution. That means x1 is non-dominated by x2 in these two cases. So let's look at this example, for example, x1 and x5, right? So x1 and x2 should not have, I should have made it to x5 to like an e e even better. All right. So x1, for the function f1, right, it has to be minimized, so it is better than x5 in that one objective. Whereas in the second objective, x5 is better than x1 right so solution x1 is not worse than x2 in all objectives right so solution x1 is not worse than x5 in all objectives in this case because in f1 it is better right and x1 is strictly better than x5 in at least one objective in this case it is strictly better than x5 in f uh, f1 right so likewise you can compare the same thing with x2 and x4 in x2 it is better in f1 right and x4 is better in f2 because it's maximizing so that means x2 is not dominating x4 x4 is not not dominating x2 so these are the pair of non-dominating solution it doesn't have to be only two right it could be more than non-dominating solution so for example if we have here x3 or uh, say some of the x6 i could say that x2 and x6 are not dominating each other x4 and x6 are not dominating each other okay then we can collect these kind of non-dominated solutions and then sort them in some sort of order so this one is a, a ascending order once we have this so solutions uh, sorted like this we know which solution to pick based on which uh, whichever say the ob objective function that you're focusing on if your payoff is the best uh, one to be focusing on the person who's uh, say uh, the investor for example the person is more about um, um, say uh, 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 what we call the income based investor if uh, for that particular person we can go only for the payoff the probability of achieving that payoff is not a criteria for him that person so in that sense or is uh, the investor whatever the risk level we can pick one of these uh, solutions and then accordingly uh, use that as our fitness value and then feedback uh, for the next iteration that's how it is going to be the fitness is computed and then okay, so we add that uh, non-dominated solution and then we do the fitness computation following that so the fitness based on say uh, one other criteria uh, is simply uh, the what is the non-domination level that you ha have like we have in the, in the previous figure we have three levels right how far are you from a, a, a preset number and that would determine how good my uh, say uh, returns going to be in this case 
So we use also the crowding distance to determine the fitness of the solution. The crowding distance is determined is really a measure of such space around a particular solution here, uh, which is not occupied by any other solution. So if the solution is empty, you have a unique solution that is not going to be, uh, say, dominated by, say, uh, other solution, you can easily pick that one up. So that's going to be another uh, measure that to find the fitness value in this case. So once we have, we find the stopping criteria. Again, that depends on the risk level of an individual investor, and then we can exit. So for us, uh, in this competition, this simulation, we don't have any criteria, so we collect all the different possible solutions, which we call the right optimal solution. So then we compute the new population, and then repeat the whole idea, right? And then we get the final, uh, say, result. So here is the experimental setup. What we have, we have real data collected from Bloomberg for S&P 500 in one year, and for American option, we have multiple different uh, individual stocks, not an index, but an individual stocks. And we also use the Chicago Board of Options Exchange Volatility Index in this case to estimate the volatility. Though uh, uh, the volatility, uh, I didn't discuss about the, uh, say. Uh, uh, how the volatility is going to be say, uh, inserted in our model. So that's a separate uh, uh, topic. It will take uh, a bit longer. I, I'm not getting into that. So for uh, a contract that is one week long or three weeks, six months, one year, we have multiple different sets. And the initial setting up of the uh, co uh, contract is like this, that the strike price is smaller than the stock price. That means if you are buying a, a call option, if the strike is smaller than the, st uh, the, the, the stock price, you are ready to exercise immediately, right? That means soon after you contract, you get you, you are ready, like you, you are in the money. That's what it means, you are in the money, right? Because S minus K becomes positive, that means your payoff is greater than zero. If it is at the money, you want to make profit, so you want to wait for some more time to see how it is going, how the price is changing. Whereas out of the money means generally most of the contract are out of the money. That means the stock price has to work some extent to reach beyond the strike price. So that S minus K becomes positive for the European option. And, and that means the premium is going to be lower because you had to definitely wait for some time to see the price crossing the strike price. So for the, these are the uh, uh, multiple different uh, scenarios here, but these are not the actual results. And we'll see how uh, the particular, say, result will look like. So these are the uh, uh, the Firefly parameters, like 100 uh, particles. We have 250 iterations. There are a few parameters, uh, randomization, randomization, light absorption coefficient, attractiveness value, etc. So these are all preset. So these are all varied for multiple different, uh, different experiments. So here's the first set of solution for European option. This is for the adaptive weighted sum based uh, firefly algorithm. I think I'll skip for now. I'll go to the next one, which is the non dominator solid one. So for both, we could collect the results and then put the we, we see the Pareto optimal solution here. And this full Pareto friend is observed in all these experiments. And this quality of this Pareto friend is determined by actual real data the, we had from the uh, Bloomberg. So the we captured the true option value with less than 1% error. This is the minimum error, which is close to 1% right? for this set of, uh, uh, say, values of so the stock price, initial stock price, the strike price, and the value of option B, 35.4. Now, this is kind of uh, the red one here means the, uh, I think we have mentioned here, red means negative error, green means positive error. So that means the uh, how closely it fits. That's that's the idea uh, of the error. So based on say the risk level, a particular say uh, uh, say um, investor will pick one of these solutions. This is the maximum payoff. So if you are really willing to spend a lot of time to see this happening, and that means you are taking a lot of risks to see this one appearing really happening, right? So in a particular time, which is a bit. Uh, possibly unusual, but this is showing in this case, so it might happen. So you have to wait, that means your risk is higher. So you, uh, to, to achieve the maximum payout. So depending on the risk level of the dual investor, each of these solution is, uh, say, uh, sufficient for 
uh, being in the market or being uh, for for the investor being uh, in the contract achieving the uh, 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 purchasing the contract to, or to enter the contract. So here a few conclusion. We have this normal model developed for option pricing problem as a much objective optimization, and the experiment we show is competency of a model and efficiency of algorithms. And in 99% of our experiments, the algorithms are successful in capturing true option price as an option a solution to the pre friend the max, maximum of 2% here. So the, uh, the true option price is the one that we already have available from the open, uh, say, market data. Okay. So using historical contract to approximate the current level risk is very efficient in this case, though I did not discuss to uh, in detail the uh, how the risk is coming into effect, but we, we, we have that. that. Okay, I think I'll, uh, this is for the first part of my uh, talk, uh, how I'm doing for time. So it's almost half an hour, 40, yeah, 40 minutes. So I still have uh, 20 minutes. If there is any question, please, for now. I can yeah. take some questions now uh, okay. before going to the next uh, topic. So can we ask you a question? Right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, first question, let me take uh, from a lady. Mm -hmm. um, what are the novelties that are found in Firefly for which we can use it uh, financial domain? Or just it is an approach? Uh, what was the first part of the question? What was the? What are the novelties that are found in Firefly? Abilities or mobilities? Novelities. Novelties. Novelties. Oh, novelties. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, okay. <clears throat> novelty always depends on how you map the given natural uh, observations to a given problem, right? So, the novelty that I mentioned here, um, the attractiveness, right, it increases based on the brightness of the firefly, right? So, so the brightness attracts more... Uh, um, uh, say the firefly to a particular firefly, right? So for us in the stock market, if I am a writer, that means I'm the person who is going to sell the underlying stock, I'm going to somehow manage to get more uh, people uh, attracted to towards my contract, right? How I do that is to write it in a such a way that the premium is either low for them to get, say, uh, into the contract, uh, because the premium is again very subjective. I can set it to any number as a writer. So likewise, if someone else is writing, that person may set it to a higher higher value for the uh, uh, premium. So based on the same contract, same particular underlying stock, right? I can set to a particular uh, premium. Other person will set another premium. If my premium is premium is lower, I will get attracted, right, by investors. So that's the idea of the novelty of the um, uh, firefly algorithm say mapping to the option pricing problem right so that's how the uh, the first mapping is done once we see the mapping then we study further how the firefly works and we bring similar uh, mapping for other parameters so that not just the attractiveness of the brightness there are other parameters which can be now made into a firefly problem and study the option price as a firefly problem. And of course, there are these fireflies studied in other uh, real world applications, but I don't know much about those applications. So we are looking at the uh, firefly application for finance problems. So that's where the novelty is. Mapping the firefly, understanding of uh, firefly, map it to the current problem that you are focusing on, that is option pricing in this case. Okay, next question. Hope I, how hope I, hope I answered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, how can you justify that Firefly approach is a novel approach for opinion uh, option pricing issue? Yeah, so we are able to map right, the parameters from the Firefly algorithm to the problem in the uh, option pricing right, problem. So these two parameters when we do the correct mapping so we can use how the firefly simulation uh, algorithm has been working for pricing the options so that's the mapping is the core criteria that's the uh, most um, uh, say involved process that is not easy to 
uh, say come by right so that's where the uh, research is like we have to spend a lot of time to see what are the corresponding parameters and how we can try to utilize the firefly for option price right uh, then the last uh, probably for the last question what are the applications in this research area for further research oh in this case yeah so so what we have done is only for say uh, okay in, in terms of the styles america uh, european and american that's one thing we have done and of course what i did not present was that something the the um uh, what is called the value added uh, service that means we can utilize this algorithm as a back uh, say uh, in, in in the back end computer so that people who are having no knowledge on investment like no knowledge of different uh, products right many many investors really don't they, they don't know how they work right they they have money they just give it to these people or they just get some ideas from say investors or the the so called the brokers right so the brokers are the one who are going to run this um uh algorithm in order to provide service to these investors who have money to invest so if if the people say that okay i'm i'm okay if i get a 10% profit right so they may suggest okay you might use this technique this technique or this technique that is one way of providing service and so that we can improve upon uh providing service okay that's providing service how to improve or uh, what is the further research using firefly for option pricing is providing service and providing a more uh say detailed service detail service in the sense not just what these people are asking us to tell right so i want 10% uh say uh profit what is the idea that you suggest i can suggest one but then uh, on top of it i can suggest okay instead of that if you invest in this idea in this particular say uh product right in this particular option using the same technique i can give this uh, this person a different profit level so that means different level of satisfaction so that is another survey so we we have done uh, that kind of work in 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 the paper that we have published before the further in addition to the service itself what we can do is to um, take this five flag algorithm we have done all the uh, say um, two objectives so far right the the payoff and the um, the probability of achieving the payoff we can relax those two with the means we can increase the number of objectives to more number of objectives because there are more objectives to be done like uh, so for example risk itself can be brought in as an objective one thing and the uh, uh the time like the time value we didn't though we uh, say had this ex exercise time as part of the probability of achieving that uh, say payoff we can separate this um, time as another objective we want to achieve higher profit at a, uh, a sooner time at an earlier time right so that time becomes another objective so we can split that so for further research we have not done that part yet we, we formulated but the student finished and left so we didn't i didn't have another student to continue on this so that's something that we can definitely work on for further research yeah uh professor tulsiram i have a question sure. uh, is is in um, Time series form. Sorry, say it again. Are the data what you are using the stock uh -huh. price? Is it in time series form? Yeah, it is. Well, one of them, many of them are time series, right? So yeah, uh, uh, and let me see these SP five hundred. Yeah, they're all like uh, time series form. Yeah, they're not. Okay. I think uh, daily prices, but they are. Um, okay, I can recall. um most likely they are monthly prices what i have right so they are not a daily for sure so they they are time series yes uh, then um, that means by using this firefly algorithm uh, of course multi objective firefly algorithm you are looking for the pattern pattern of the stock market i mean whether it is rising or i mean declining or increasing no. or pattern you were just look no no that we did not we did not use uh, firefly for uh, say the uh, uh, price behavior no 
whatever price is available we are using it as it is right so in order to make a better say estimate on the option value if we know yes. the price behavior it would be better right so that's exactly what we are going the next part of the talk like deep learning model for predictions that price prediction yeah Based yeah. on this, you have forecast. Okay. Right. Okay. So if you forecast that if you predict the price is better, that means I would know how the price is going to behave. That means I can decide if I want to invest in this particular option or not. That means if I want to invest or if I want to get into the contract or not. Yeah. Oh, you were just trying to get a good pattern. Yes. This is the second part of this talk. Yeah. Okay. That's when I use the deep learning here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Of course, neural network based new, uh, uh, deep learning here. For, yeah, neural uh, network we did before, but now we have uh, uh, this is deep learning. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. 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 Let me continue. Sure, sure. You can. So I. I um, okay. So almost eleven thirty. That means it's uh, one hour fully. One hour. <laughs> I'll try to finish this in next twenty minutes or so. Okay. Okay, so so this is the second part of the talk, uh, which uh, involves uh, price forecasting or price prediction, which might be used. But I'm not going to use the price prediction uh, for the option pricing, but it could be done, right? So that's the idea here. So we have some basic introduction, then how to price prediction, what are some related work in the uh, uh, deep learning area, and what we try to do here, and some results, right? Of course, we know deep neural network, which is most common these days. Uh, it's an advanced branch of the ANN, artificial neural network, of course, which gained enormous popularity. It is effectiveness on uh, prediction-based um, uh, problems. And of course, they are promising uh, performance uh, for various uh, problems, such as the natural language processing, robotics, etc. But we are trying to use this idea is to price uh, so, uh, predict uh, price uh, stock prices here in this uh, particular topic. So, what is price prediction? Is given historical data of last n number of data days for a particular stock or index. Try to predict the next day price. That's what our objective here in this case is. So, one 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 day ahead. So, we we have some some other work done. Instead of one day ahead, multiple days ahead, one week ahead one month ahead kind of, uh, uh, based on the initial say data that you're feeding it. It is formulated of course as a regression based problem and we have uh, many researchers of course you have used the uh, I don't know why it's jumping RNN to solve the regression based problem with sequence of data. So this is when the sequence data coming into picture now that uh, Dr. Dash mentioned. Okay. One important problem of course is training right the network using RNN is that of course you cannot keep track of the long input dependencies while training right? that means it doesn't have too much of memory to say keep track of all the past events in uh, how the past events reflected on the prices so when we have a large amount of data some of the conventional approaches as I think uh, multi-layer perceptron CNN RNN they lack high accuracy for the prediction problem and also take longer time. So we want to have a faster and accurate neural network uh, approach in this case. So most of the research, of course, they formulate the problem of the prediction either in two categories. One is future moment prediction or future value prediction. How the future is moving, the, the, the whole which direction it is moving, positive, negative, or up or down, right? Like the one that we saw. Whereas the actual value prediction is another problem. Like so that's the regression problem. This is seen more, uh, more as a clustering problem. And right? this is classification or clustering problem. So we have done some work on this using what is known as the and root clustering algorithm. This is another kind of a energy inspired technique. So, so I'm not going to talk about this. And the angle clustering or the price moment power prediction. Um, we are going to talk about this feature value prediction for the uh, say uh, prediction problems. 
So in this direction, there are multiple uh, work. Uh, I think I will uh, not go into the details of each one of them, but what I'll give you a general picture of uh, that the what they have reported for multiple different models, MLP, GAN, and then the Gosh model, etc., is the uh, mean average deviation using real exchange daily values of Nasdaq uh, stock exchange, and each one has its own as a lack. Like so, th that's how the the, the literature got uh, developed to do more as uh, a recent techniques. So some of the uh, tech, uh, say, uh, the earlier works also show that the neural net methods are very competitive in the hyperparameter configuration, and also CNN have had least mean square error. Right? The most interesting part, of course, this research is that they have worked with more deeper networks compared to previous work, so each one can go further deeper uh, as the comp computational power becomes, uh, I mean, uh, increasing uh, computational power becomes available. Right? So many of them have used this uh, LSTM for the RNN, the long short term memory network. <laughs> also, some with uh, some have used RNN with a gated record unit, GRU. They have applied for stock price movement prediction in recent work by this uh, these authors. And they also shown some promising success. So they use the so-called bi-directional gated record unit. So the potential for this RNN, BGRU, or combination of LSTM and GRU needs to be studied in depth for stock price prediction. That's the motivation we got reading through this literature, that what sort of problem that we should be working on, which will be unique. And also which should uh, bring a better say, quality results. So what we do here is with attempt experiment with experiment uh, different types of RNN with LSTM and GRU to predict the future stock price based on the previous day's data. That's what we are, our idea is. So we call that as hybrid deep learning because we are hybridizing one is LSTM and then the GRU in this case. So to achieve this goal, we propose two known DNN approaches, which is uh, LSTM and GRU, and then we hybridize them. Hybridizing means like we try to use in the same iteration both, uh, say, networks. So this architecture will allow us to deal with providing prediction-based uh, historical stock prices. Then we have done, of course, extensive experiments to show effectiveness of this proposed hybrid model. The architecture proposed network is simple enough to deal with training, testing, and validating. It is almost like a, a, a sweet through, as we see once we see the uh, um, architecture, we will we'll, we'll understand. First, what we do is to pass the input to the LSTM network, which will generate first level prediction. And then we pass that output of LSTM into a GRU layer to get the final prediction. And then, of course, based on the error, we feedback and try to update the parameter values and then start the LSTM again. So we have LSTM layer, we have drop of layer in between. It is to avoid what is known as overfitting error, right? It happens many times. And then that goes into the GRU and then again drop out and then a, another denser layer. So why LSTM? So that's one of the um, uh, basically uh, uh, question that we thought we should first answer before getting into this uh, problem. We know it's a derivative of RNN, right, which operates on sequential data. And of course, RNN has been put as one of the best methods used to solve some of the popular methods like speech recognition, test uh, uh, pattern recognition, etc. And, and uh, to a large extent also in the finance models, right? but we didn't see a combination of LSTM GRU when we did this work. Right? Uh, to solve this long-term dependency problem, these authors, uh, Crater and others, propose LSTM, which has a memory unit which can keep track of the certain moment of trading data, not the entire data. You don't need to keep all the data, uh, memory on, uh, on the network. One other advantage of using LSTM is that it can learn automatically when to forget the memory for a particular sequence. That's most uh, unique idea for LSTM. Like, we also need to know what to forget here. Right? We don't want to keep track of such things. So the transition equations are given here. We have the input, forget gate, output gate, and then the the uh, U is, uh, what is U? U is the activation function here. Right? 
And of course, B is the bias function. I think all of them are given here. The input gate, forget, output, memory, cell, and the activation function, hidden state, and the bias for each of the gates. So we have this set up already for the, the uh, LSTM. If you know LSTM, for, this is a very simple uh, architecture we have. And for GRU, we try to combine the input and the forget node into one node called ZT. I think we'll get to that in a couple of slides here. So the more different, the main difference, of course, LSTM GRU is that GRU combines forget and input into a single up, update gate. And it also merges the cell state and the hidden state, right? So those are basic ideas of the LSTM and GRU. So, so GRU model, of course, is simpler. It's a faster network than the standard LSTM, although the basic purpose of GRU is same as the LSTM, right? Very same, right? We can get the same uh, result as LSTM, but because we are combining them in hybrid uh, structure, uh, we are trying to expect, we, we, we expect a better result for the prediction problem. So the hybrid networks proposed model is a combination of both LSTM and GRU. We pass the input back to the LSTM unit with one hidden layer, and we get the output. Of course, we have a one layer, two layer, three layer uh, experiments done. Then we pass FSLCM input to the GRU, and the second layer, and we get the FGRU, that is the output of the GR unit. Then we pass FGRU in the dense network followed by linear activation. Finally, we calculate the equilibrium loss between the prediction and the ground truth, right? So the linear uh, loss in this case. And then back propagate this lock to the network for the uh, to, to update the model parameters. So this is the equilibrium distance between the actual value and the prediction uh, problem here. So where these are the uh, few of the parameters. And these are all standard. So this is all nothing new for uh, from our side. Only the combination of those two is the new one, and then how to forget a particular set of data for from the LSTM is another new thing there. So this is implemented in Python using Keras libraries, right? Which helps a lot to customize the network. In this case, also of Atom Optimizer, and the 20 epochs on a machine with 32 gig RAM, 4 gigahertz clock rate. Okay. And then um, we, we have the SRP 500 times this data, and uh, we, we go through the pre processing and then through the RNN model, and then finally the prediction in this case. Okay. So, this pre processing preserves the related pair patterns but changes only the range of values of for scaling, whatever we need in this case. Right. The institution, of, I mean, the intuition behind this pre-processing is to make it compatible to propose hybrid network. That's the only purpose of data pre-processing for us in this case. We kind of enable data to go through those two hybrid uh, setup. And then we have the data from 2015 to 2016. We use 80% of it for training, 10% for uh, validation, and then testing for uh, 20 percent here and then we use min max scalar for normalization purposes and these are the metrics that we have used mean absolute error mean square error mean absolute percentage error in this case for finding the final results so we have multiple different say results coming from uh, from one of the uh, uh, the papers like one other reference number one where they only had the mean square error so for us, the proposed SDM, uh, SGL uh, method uh, gives the least mean square error, and the others uh, didn't compute the mean average error or the percentage error. So we, we show that here. So because they are not there, only we can say that we have a better results on the mean square error. As I mentioned before, the overfitting uh, a prime or common modeling error, which occurs during training and as well, you know, it is very common, right, to people all know. So it happens when a function is too closely fit to the limited set of data points, well, if you are focusing only a small set of data. Mm -hmm. To handle this special type of error, we use the so-called dropout layer after each of your, and that's the purpose of using the dropout layer we mentioned in earlier in the architecture. Basically, this is not what is known as a regularization technique. Uh, <clears throat> regularization idea is uh, again purely statistical idea. 
Uh, recently, we did, uh, done one other work on uh, using virtualization technique for uh, uh, not um, a deep neural network, but for regular neural network with the uh, virtualization techniques to predict uh, the option values, right? So based on the option, uh, say, uh, market data. So that's something different. This is this is not the reference I'm talking about. It's a very recent work that we uh, we published. Actually, the conference is happening this week. Uh, it's called the IEEE CompSAC uh, Competition uh, Applied Computing. IEEE Computer Society is uh, Society of Applied Computing, CompSAC. So they have what is known as the DSAT, uh, the abbreviations. I just don't give up that two of one is the track called DSAT, the other track called data. So uh, we have a, a paper then actually this week. So I think the presentation is, I'm not sure, tomorrow day after. Sometime. So with the help of this concept, we figured out that our network performs better with the dropout layer than the proposed network without the dropout layer. So here is the LSTM two-layer training versus prediction. So the green one, the actual closing price, normalized ones, and this is the predicted one with two layers, just LSTM. This is just SRU for the same data, uh, uh, trading versus prediction. So this is the uh, actual, and this is the predicted one. So they're not close enough. With the three-layer, kind of the GRU gives them slightly better results with the some outliers here, whereas the um, for the uh, LSTM, it is still, the gap is still large. With the hybrid model, with this LSTM followed by GRU, we can see that the um, the prediction is following very closely to the actual, uh, say, closing prices of the S&P 500 data. Same thing with the, uh, this is uh, uh, with dropout and this is without dropout, right? So that means we are not, uh, so we, we still have the so-called the uh, the uh, overfitting error here, which brings this gap. In this case, again, uh, different architecture. We have LSTM single layer, multiple of them, and then we compare the uh, errors. So we so ours at the bottom uh, bottom row showing the smallest among all the different say errors that we see here. Some of the conclusions, the post model is trained on large historical data and compared on model with state of art work in literature, because it means square error, and model is capable of handling large variations. And best of all, this first attempt in using deep learning using a uh, based uh, hybrid approach to solve the stock price prediction and more deep learning research in the field of computation finance may follow this model. So the multiple different ideas are there, but we are here to explore those ideas here. So we intend to perform experiments with individual stock symbols because for right now we have done S&P 500 uh, because those data are not necessarily a daily data, which is uh, we still need to test if uh, this uh, hybrid model works for uh, uh, daily closing prices. Other financial predictions like foreign exchange currency rates supposed to be one of the students who to work on this, uh, a PhD student soon. I think he's joining in this fall, in September. <laughs> These are a few of the uh, <coughs> references from this work. I think that's my end of this uh, second part of the talk, and I, I'll be happy to take some questions there, please. So I think I'm, t I'm taking full two hours. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> but the presentation was really very nice. And I think the researchers okay. who are working in this uh, financial computation uh, must have uh, got a lot of information and uh, uh, I mean they have got a lot of uh, stuff from your talk to uh, put some new idea into their research. I think there is no more questions left here. Uh, so uh, thank you, thank you professor for giving such a nice presentation. No Thank you. You said you have questions or no?
హలో గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ సార్ ఐఎమ్ వందన ఫ్రమ్ జిఐటి యూనివర్సిటీ యాక్చువల్లీ సార్ ఐ వాంట్ టు నో సమ్ ఫస్ట్ ఏరియా ఇన్ మెషిన్ లెర్నింగ్ టు గెట్ ద ఫండింగ్ i think uh, bandana you will get all this information from the next talk okay okay ma'am okay ma'am so our okay. topic is different yeah. so please uh, you just stick to the topic and you can put any question related to the topic okay yeah, okay but ma'am the question is more about funding for machine learning right this 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 day yes, is like uh, yeah machine learning is uh, very popular and uh, if you have a proper uh, application area defined for the uh, machine learning i think you have quite a good chance of getting funding uh, uh, say uh, i don't know from which agency you are talking about but i think uh, you have to have good uh, 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 domain specific problem defined unique def- uh, domain specific problem right so finance okay. is one of the areas uh, which is not many people say doing in in uh, say academic setting in canada at least yes, so sir. so my my funding one part of my say for example discovery grant i got just uh, two months ago for next five years is uh, uh, addressing the machine learning part like right, for the prediction which is unique right i know in canada not many people are working in the finance area but in industry of course a lot of people are working a lot of people in in, in finance okay so they they, they try to they use it use all the practice yeah. yeah. thank you sir okay, thank you uh, any other question from participants so chapi rani she was asking some question yeah where is that sir what is the question no టెక్స్ for a particular topic problem and then slowly come down <laughs> yeah <coughs> any question from uh, from participants any more question so you can directly ask so there is no problem yeah so you can email me if you have questions for sure no, yeah i am not getting anything no i think i don't know yeah. this much oh mera band ho gaya ha ha okay i think there is no more question that's it okay thank uh, you they, they have also your mail id they can be in touch yeah i, ha- I have it in the very first yeah, slide and they can discuss with you they can yeah, be you, you you see that email id here right tulsi at sure. cs that you manage to manage yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so you can also get your mail id from our yeah you you have it right dr dash yeah, you have it, it and, it and everyone is having it yeah, they can contact you either yeah yeah, yeah. and you and can you, also visit you. my web page in in case you want to see what are the different projects and uh, publications if you want any of them okay. be happy to send you that sure yeah. okay. so i think okay. i'll be touch with you because uh, sure. uh, yeah. for get some data of yeah your finance sure. sure sure yeah yeah okay uh, yeah. so shall we stop here sure sure thank you very much i'm glad thank that it worked so uh, full uh, full session no problem technical problem that's very good no technical <laughs> that is the uh, blessing <laughs> thank you Yeah, it worked now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
so our next session will start exactly at 11 o'clock 11 a.m so all of you i just request to uh, lock in before 10 minutes 10 or 15 minutes before the session starts thank you all thank you <laughs>